Thank you, Professor, very much. And thank you, um, Bishop uh, Sanchez Sorondo, for the wonderful invitation to be with all you good uh, people. I very much have enjoyed these last two days hearing the papers and being with you. Thanks for that privilege. Let me just say at the outset, uh, as I give this paper, I'll have my philosopher's hat on, but also my hat as, um, as bishop and evangelist. Um, an evangelist very interested in what I think is the number one problem facing us in the West, namely the massive disaffiliation of our own people, especially the young. And I've been studying this for a long time, and study after study have shown that when young people say are asked, why are you leaving the church, they often will say science. Namely, it's irreconcilable, science and religion. I can't be scientific and have faith. Science has refuted religion. And this often resolves itself, I find, into this scientism that I speak of. And the professor put his finger on, on one of the problems with it. Um, namely the view that knowledge is simply coterminous with the scientific way of knowing. Knowledge is reducible to the scientific form of knowledge. And so a strategy I often try to use is to show there are other paths of knowledge. As the professor just pointed out, uh, scientism shares with its close cousin logical positivism the dubious distinction of being self-refuting. Because the one thing the claim that all knowledge is reducible to science is not is a scientific claim. Just as the logical positivists say, the only meaningful statements are those that can be empirically verified. Well, that statement can't be empirically verified. So scientism founders, uh, you know, it, it collapses of its own weight. What I want to do, though, is to show just very briefly three paths that get us beyond this uh, scientific problem. Because my hope is that even as we celebrate the sciences, we don't fall prey to a scientism, which I think is causing trouble for a lot of our younger people. So, first path, and we talked about it quite a bit yesterday, the radical intelligibility of the world. So in Plato's famous parable, the prisoner chained in place within the cave and able to see only the passing shadows on the wall, manages to escape and to access higher and higher levels of reality. The flickering images represent the world of our ordinary sense experience, the world legitimately explored by the physical sciences. But to see only that dimension is an epistemic impoverishment, Plato thinks. And the first step out of the cave is to appreciate the realm of mathematical objects. Again, we talked about that a lot yesterday. The pure abstractions of arithmetic and geometry. To grasp these qua abstractions is to move quite clearly out of the evanescent order of sensible reality. When one truly understands the quadratic formula or a simple equation, 2 plus 3 equals 5, one has grasped a reality that does not come and go and that obtains in any possible world. Another way to express this is to say the inquirer has moved from the visible to the invisible order. David Tracy, who is an emeritus professor of philosophy and theology at the University of Chicago, in a recently published essay entitled The Ultimate Invisible, draws our attention precisely to this platonic construal of the mathematical. I'm quoting him now. Aside from the religions, the major form of invisibility in our time is that provided by mathematics and the mathematization of modern science nurtured in the early modern period by Galileo, close quote. Tracy observes, furthermore, the classical definition of the circle, a locus of coplanar points equidistant from its center, is easy enough to memorize but absolutely impossible to imagine or concretize. In fact, a picture of a wheel might suggest to the beginner in geometry the notion of circularity, but it could never adequately represent it, since it could never suffice to answer the question, why is the circle round? In point of fact, we could never answer such a question by remaining in the field of the visible or the imaginative. Here's Tracy again, quote, we can answer the question, but only by moving into a realm of intelligent supposing a realm that can neither be seen nor imagined, but can be supposed and understood, close quote. The inquiring mind knows these invisibility by entering into intimate communion with them in their distinctive arena of existence. Modern and now postmodern science are, is deeply indebted to mathematics, indeed unthinkable apart from it. Here's Tracy again, I'm quoting, since Galileo, Descartes, Leibniz, and others Modern science has employed three essential elements, dispassionate empirical observation, mathematical conceptual formulations of its hypotheses and theories, and experimental testing of all its theories, close quote. If we focus on that second indispensable step in the scientific method, 
we see that the very disciplines that in the minds of many today most root us in the empirical order, in fact, lift us beyond to the invisible order. Therefore, the search for intelligibility continues to lead us out of the cave and into ever more uh, intense expressions of being. But the journey comes to a conclusion only when, to follow the Platonic master metaphor, we gaze up to the sun, that's to say the light that finally illumines anything that we come to perceive or know. Only when we see the one who gives intelligibility and hence who gives being, the one who in Plato's language lies therefore beyond the being, would the mind come to rest. But why should we suspect there is such a giver? David Tracy comments that the sciences come to the end of their capacity when they confront the puzzling limit question, which they on their own terms could never even possibly address. Namely, why should the world be intelligible at all? Precisely because they rest inevitably on this very assumption, the sciences themselves could never answer this question. Einstein himself grasped the nettle of this when he commented, quote, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible, close quote. Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, in his indispensable introduction to Christianity, said the only finally credible answer is that there's a governing intelligence that's imbued the universe with intelligibility. In point of fact, this intuition, Ratzinger contends, is evident in our term recognition. When we recognize, we think again what has been antecedently thought. So there's the first path, and I'm, I'm following up on things we talked about yesterday quite a bit. The intelligibility of the world, the mathematical intelligibility available, I think is a path beyond a purely reductive uh, materialism. Here's a second path, the immateriality of the mind. A second way of breaking past um, uh, scientism is by examining the faculty of subjective consciousness that corresponds to the intelligibility of the world. Representing the classical and medieval consensus on the matter, Thomas Aquinas, with typical scholastic pith, said, intellectus in actu est intelligible in actu. The intellect in act is the intelligible in act. Such a statement would be incoherent on a simple observer-observed model of epistemology, so typical of the modern sciences. But it's luminously clear on an objective participant model that held sway throughout the pre-modern period. There is, in a word, a deep correspondence, adequatio is Thomas's term for it, a correspondence between the invisible intelligible patterns the mind comes to know and the nature of the mind that knows them. On a modern, purely mechanistic or naturalistic reading, what we call mind or consciousness is at most an epiphenomenon of material forces in the brain, following deterministic laws of cause and effect, or even, we could say, random uh, movement. To use very contemporary language, it's an emergent pattern of more elemental materials and energy. The seemingly intentional nature of consciousness becomes, on this reading, more or less an illusory product of efficient causes that produce it. But Aquinas and the whole pre-modern tradition would say when the mind entertains and understands a pure intelligibility, such as a mathematical relationship or a formal structure, it's not trading in material reality. It has conformed itself as an adequatio to the invisible and hence must belong itself, at least in its higher faculties, to that order of being. In a similar way to grasp as any user of language must, the formal syntactical structures of language is possible only if the mind, in some sense, transcends mere imagination and perception. There's a classical argument for the immateriality of consciousness that was made famous by C.S. Lewis in the 20th century, but versions of it can be found throughout the tradition. The thrust of it is that an entirely naturalistic account of reality cannot explain the very ratiocinative process by which one would draw such a conclusion. Every act of deduction or formal reasoning involves the making of connections between premises and conclusions, connections that are causal indeed, but not in the materialist manner. David Bentley Hart, one of the, I think, most perceptive observers of this whole issue, took as indicative of the immateriality of the mind, I'm quoting him now, the syntax and semantics of acts of reason, or of any mental acts, whose internal connections appear to be conceptual or logical rather than merely physical, close quote. In Lewis's terms, if the mind is nothing but atoms bouncing off one another randomly or in accord with strict determinism, why would we ever be tempted to trust its deliverances as true, as adequate depictions of what is real? 
Once again, the very process of reasoning must represent a qualitatively different order of being than the realm of sheer mechanical causality. With regard to the immateriality of the mind, a final consideration is in order. Any honest assessment of consciousness requires us to set aside merely passive or receptive accounts of mind. On the Humean or Lockean reading, for instance, intelligence is more or less an empty theater in which the vague impressions of sense experience appear. But this is a grossly inadequate account, as, as people like, like Aquinas in the Middle Ages, Lonergan in the 20th century saw so clearly. They would argue the mind of, might be originally empty, but empty like a stomach, not like a box, which is to say, ordered actively and energetically toward that which it seeks. The properly named intellectus agens, the agent intellect, the acting intellect, restlessly and relentlessly asks of the data that it takes in, the question quid sit, what is that? Under the influence of that inquiry, it abstracts intelligible pattern from what was presented to the senses and preserved in memory. Yet having made that abstraction, it continues to press on, quid sit, placing what it knows in ever wider horizons of meaning, pushing finally toward the ultimate horizon of being itself. In Lonergan's language, the state of knowing, quote, everything about everything, close quote. This teleological lure toward the fullness of being, in Christian terms, the beatific vision, is intrinsic to the mind itself and utterly transcendent to the order of finite material being. It demonstrates, therefore, the reduction of intellection to physical processes is inadequate. Just a last observation now, last uh, path, what I'm calling the inescapability of metaphysics. Here I'm going back to Plato, Aristotle, going from physics to mathematics to metaphysics. I think that still is a, is a legitimate um, ascension. The deep ground for the scientism that plagues so many people today is in certain philosophical shifts that occurred in the late Middle Ages, most notably William of Ockham's option for a univocal conception of being over an analogical conception. On the latter reading, on rich display in the metaphysics of Aquinas, the primary referent of the term being is God's manner of existence. And the proper use of that term to describe finite creaturely realities is hence neither univocal nor equivocal, but analogical. Accordingly, finite things are properly described as participating in the fullness of being which God alone possesses. Or to state the same truth more technically, creaturely things are those, those that have received the octus ascendi, the act of being, not unrestrictedly, but rather according to a delimiting principle of essence. On this interpretation, furthermore, all creaturely beings, in the measure that they participate in God, are connected by the deepest bonds to one another. St. Francis, famously invoking brother, son, sister, moon, is not just trading in charming poetry, but that's, that's deeply congruent with this Thomistic uh, understanding. But when this understanding was abandoned, the integrated vision fell apart. If, as Occam argued, the word being is used univocally of both God and creatures, then God becomes one being, however perfect and exalted among many. Moreover, it's no longer appropriate to speak of creatures participating in the to be of God, and hence it's mere fancy to speak of finite things as ontological siblings. Rather, as Occam himself put it, quote, outside of these absolute, unrelated parts, there is no real thing, close quote. It's a very small step from Occam's shift to university, the rise of nominalism. For once the metaphysical bonds of beings to one another and God are severed, it's easy enough to treat the universal dimensions of reality as mere abstractions or linguistic uh, invention. Now, I, I think this, this typically modern understanding of the God-world relationship was taken as axiomatic by many of the founders of the physical sciences. Assuming that nature consists of discreetly existing individual things, they tended to bracket Aristotelian formal and final causality embracing almost exclusively material and efficient causality. The vision that followed was mechanistic, things bouncing off of one another, one thing influencing and reacting to the motion of other things. And if God were brought into this picture, as he was, for instance, in Newton's conception of the universe, he was construed in the nominalist manner as one impressive mechanistic cause among many, the one who initiated the cosmic process or who intervened in it from time to time. An exceptionally clear exemplification of this typically modern construal is the debate between William Paley and Charles Darwin, implied in Darwin's writing. Paley, the famous Anglican apologist, famously compared, as we know, the organisms of nature to a carefully constructed watch. 
It's inconceivable, he thought, that the delicate and complex organization of a watch came together by chance. By the same token, the structures of physical organisms have, must have been assembled by an intelligent designer. Throughout On the Origin of Species, Darwin is in conversation with Paley, whom we obviously read with great interest. And, and his fundamental disagreement with the apologist is that the combination of, as we know, random genetic mutation, time, and natural selection would adequately account for even the most complex arrangements of nature. And see, what I find interesting is not where they disagreed, it's where they agreed. They're both assuming God as some kind of mechanistic cause that assembles the parts. Uh, Paley thinking it more likely, Darwin more unlikely, but it's the same false conception of God. When we see God as Aquinas did, as the sheer act of to be itself, in and through which all things come to be, then we can talk about truly a universe. And that term I find so intriguing. Why do we refer to the collectivity of, of finite things as a universe? Universum, turn toward the one. The classical answer is the notion of being is the one toward which all things are turned. Even if we speak of multiple universes, we're not really speaking metaphysically correctly because whatever they are, they're full of existing things. They're all turned toward the one. Once we make that move, we say that their being is a contingent type of being, which depends finally upon the non-contingent ground, which is God. I, I think this path, which shows the inevitability of a metaphysical vision, is a path beyond scientism. So let's celebrate the sciences as we've been doing the last couple of days. But I think if we're interested in evangelization, we should be careful of a uh, reductive scientism. Thanks, everybody.